Hello. Uh, my name is Mike Osborne, and I'm a financial economist. And the uh, topic of my talk today is that abstract does not mean impractical. Now, we've just come through a recession. And in fact, we're not out of the recession yet. And you can ask the question, is there anything we can do to help prevent another recession? And I think there is. And what I'm going to do today is to demonstrate how some extremely abstract mathematical thinking that goes back at least 500 years can be applied to today's economic policy. In particular, the economic policy is consumer credit legislation. Now, most of us at some point or another in our lives will uh, take out a loan. We could borrow money to buy a car. We could uh, have a mortgage to buy a house. And these are big ticket items. They, they cost a lot of money. So any decision that we take is a very serious decision. And most countries in the world introduce consumer credit legislation in order to help consumers take those decisions. The legislation mediates between borrower and lender, and it provides protection to the consumer. And in 1968, the United States introduced what I believe to be the first such legislation. They introduced the Truth in Lending Act. And since then, many countries around the world have introduced similar legislation. It has similar aims, and it's based on similar principles. And one of the principles uh, of this legislation is that the consumer is provided with a measure of the cost of a loan so that you can compare one loan with another. And the question is, uh, is that a good measure? And what I want to do today is to challenge the conventional measure of the cost of a loan. Now, this is the conventional measure. It's called the APR. It's the annual percentage rate. And uh, the annual percentage rate here is described in words. This is an extract from a document that is published by the American government to help financial institutions in the United States to uh, enact the legislation accurately and well. And what you'll notice about it is that this annual percentage rate is, as the name suggests, it's a rate of interest, and it's expressed on an annual basis. But the most important thing is that it connects the amount of money that a consumer receives when they borrow some money with the amounts of money that they pay back at future times. So it's a rate of interest then that connects money coming in with money going out at different times. Now, the actual legislation is much more complicated. It's just not just put into words. It's extraordinary legislation. It's the only legislation I know that incorporates a mathematical equation. And all such legislation does this. And the greater part of most of this legislation consists of the uh, equation itself and an explanation of it. And this comes from the EU con Consumer Credit Directive. And you can see there that it's quite forbidding. So let's simplify it a little. This is a very simple uh, APR equation. And uh, it's where we have a simple numerical example of a loan of £1,000 that we take today. And we're going to pay it back in four installments of £300 each over the next four years. Uh, so we've got a loan L on the left-hand side of the equation and ABCD on the right-hand side of the equation. And you'll notice that we're, they're brought into equality so that this 1,000 on one side is made equal to the four 300s, which add up to 1,200. But we actually bring them into equality by reducing them uh, by the a rate of interest. The rate of interest is connecting them. Why? It's because there's a concept, a concept uh, called the time value of money. And this time value of money says that a pound today is not worth the same as a pound uh, next year. So if I take a pound out of my pocket and I, and I offer it to you and I say, do you want this pound today or do you want it next year? Uh, most of you will say, please, I'll, I'll have it today. If I want you to accept a sum of money next year, then I've got to offer you a little bit more. And the connection between the higher amount next year and the pound today is this rate of interest. And if it's two years, the rate of interest enters with a squared term. And if it's three years, with a cubed term, and so on. And in this particular case, this APR is 7.7%. So when you go to the bank and you ask for a loan, 
uh, they will say, okay, you've asked for a thousand, we'll give you uh, that loan, and you'll have to pay us back 300 each year for the next four years. Oh, and the interest rate is 7.7%. And by law, they're forced to tell you that. Now, if you ask them a little bit more, and you say to them, well, how is that calculated? That's a very complex calculation. And what very often happens is this. Uh, the salesperson will tell you about the simple rate of interest, which is an alternative to the APR. And the simple rate of interest is called simple because it's much easier to calculate. All you do is add up those uh, payments, A plus B plus C plus D, and you take away the amount of the loan. And what you get is called the finance charge. It's the excess amount above what you pay uh, compared with what you receive. And that finance charge is then divided by the amount of the loan, L, divided by the number of years, N, and you get the finance charge per pound borrowed per year. And in this particular case, it comes to 5%. Now, that's a much simpler way of explaining it. But the legislation doesn't like it. And uh, although you're legally allowed to quote the simple rate to the consumer, the legal rate that you must quote is the APR. And the reason is that the APR includes this concept of the time value of money, but the simple rate doesn't many, make any allowance for it. OK. That's the situation today. Some years ago, I found myself outside of the academic world. And uh, I didn't have to publish. And that meant that I could do some blue sky research and ask some questions where it didn't matter if I didn't find the answer this year, next year, or whenever. And the question that I asked myself concerned this problem. There is not one APR solving that equation. There are actually n APRs, the number of time periods in the equation. And we only use one of them. We don't use all of them. So if I ask my calculator here to calculate that rate of interest, it gives me one. It won't give me the others. If I feed it through my spreadsheet in the computer, the same thing. It's programmed to give me one, but not to give me the others. Now, why is that? Well, it's because the other interest rates that you could calculate are a bit strange, <laughs> not normal. What do we mean by strange? Well. This equation is just simply one kind of equation. It's a polynomial. That's the technical name for it. And uh, polynomials come in various forms, linear, quadratic, cubic. And the fourth period equation we've just looked at is a quartic. And you can ask yourself a question about this equation. If you know the values of a, b, c, d, etc., you can say to yourself, what value of x will reduce y to 0? And if you uh, find out what that value of x is, you've got what's called a root. And nearly 500 years ago, some Italian mathematicians discovered a very interesting thing about these roots. And what they discovered was this, that the normal numbers we're used to, integers like 1, 2, 3, fractions like 2 thirds, 3 quarters, decimals, 3.142. These regular numbers that we're used to that you find along the real number line, they're not enough to satisfy the calculation of all these roots. You need another kind of number. And the kind of number you need is called complex. And a complex number is called complex because it has two parts. The first part is the real number that we're all used to. And the second part comes in units of the square root of minus 1. Well, what is the square root of minus 1? You can put yourself to sleep at night thinking about that, uh, and you'll probably not find an answer, because it appears to be an incompressible lump. It's a unit, and we give it a name. We, we call it the imaginary unit, and it's, given the, 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 it's denoted by i. And so a complex number is a real number plus another real number times i. And you can see there we also have a diagram, a chart, and that's the complex plane. And so that number x there is not on the number line. It's off the number line. It's, uh, in this particular case, it's a, a quarter along the number line and three quarters of i upwards. And that circle is there because it's a circle of radius 1. And most of the roots that we think about when we solve these equations tend to occur close to that circle. 
So let's go back to the original problem. Here we have a very simple loan, and actually we've got these extremely abstract solutions. We've got the 7.7% that we first thought of, and we've also got um, a highly negative solution, and we've got two complex ones. Well, what on earth do complex or imaginary interest rates mean? Well, here they are again. This time I've shown them on this uh, diagram. And you can see we've got four empty circles there, the dots, and they denote the four roots. And then on the right-hand side of that circle, on the real number line, there's a gray dot. That's the point one. And if you take a root, one plus r, and you subtract one from it, what you get is the interest rate r. So the distance, those dotted lines, the distance between a root and the point one on the number line denotes the, the interest rate. So each of those dotted lines, then, is an interest rate. What are we to make of all of this? We've got these really strange interest rates. Now, remember, the numbers themselves have been around nearly 500 years. And these financial equations have been used for nearly 400 years. So over these centuries, what have economists and financial experts learned about them? What have they done with them? Well, the answer is very little. Mostly, they've been ignored. And if they have been considered, the typical reaction is this one. And I've highlighted the crucial bit there um, about these equations. It is extremely probable that all but one of these roots will be either negative or imaginary, in which case they will have no economic significance. So that's been the conclusion. Well, we're now in the 21st century, and I've got a different answer. And the different answer is that these interest rates do have use, and they do have meaning. So let's begin with use. Here is another equation. You won't find it in the textbooks. And before, we had four equations, each one having a different root in it. One of them the normal one, three of them the strange ones. What we've done here is to collapse those four equations into one. So we've got L, the loan, on the left-hand side. We've simply added up all those repayments on the right-hand side on the top. And on the bottom, we've got one plus all the interest rates multiplied together. Now, that's a new equation. And the fact that we can put all those interest rates together in one equation means that they have use. But without meaning, it's not going to tell us anything. It's just playing around with the maths. So what's the meaning? Well, there is a relationship between the structure of those repayments that we make and the structure of the interest rates. And this relationship is quite precise, it's quite definite, and it's very beautiful, but it's also a bit complicated. So what I'm going to do today is to talk you through it. I'm going to uh, give you some words and illustrate the words with some numbers. So let's take a look at these numbers here. At the top line, we've got the loan that we've just been looking at with the even repayments. We've got four payments of 300. And on the bottom line, you have 1 plus the 7.7% times the product of those strange interest rates. What does that product mean? Well, what it actually means is it tells you the number of times that orthodox rate has been applied during the life of the loan. Let's go to the second line. What happens if we uh, reconstruct the loan, we reorganize it such that we have a large payment right up front in the first year of 900 and three smaller payments later? What does that do to the interest rates? Well, what it does, it means that if you look at the bottom line, the interest rate, the orthodox conventional one that my calculator uh, calculates, is 13.4%. So that's gone up. But the number of times that rate is applied goes down, and that's measured by the product of the other interest rates, which is only 1.4. Let's move to a back-loaded loan now, a different structure again. We put the 900 towards the rear of the loan. What does that do to the interest rates? Well, the conventional rate goes down, and the product of the strange rates goes up, so that we're applying the conventional rate more times now. And finally, at the bottom, we've got a super backloaded loan. And look very carefully, compare the top line with the bottom line. If you go from this even set of repayments to a super backloaded loan, what happens is that here, the bank is actually taking more from you than you did before. It's got an extra 50 in the final repayment in this backloaded loan. But look at what happens to the APR, the conventional one that the law tells us to compare. It's actually gone down from 7.7 .7 to 6.6. .6. So, if you're uh, a financial organization and you're faced with this legislation which forces you to tell the consumer how to measure the cost of a loan, 
and you know that the consumers are going to go for the loans that have the lowest APR, you know that you've got to offer the best deal in terms of the APR. But at the same time, you've got to protect your profits, you've got to protect your revenue. And therefore, what are you going to do? The best thing for you to do is to create some back-loaded products. And that is exactly what they've done. Here, we see a typical loan today, and compared with what it was when I was your age, and most loans were even repayments. And what's happened here is that we've got a typical car loan. I took this from the internet a few days ago. And you notice it has 48 payments of 229 pounds. But then I've highlighted in red an optional final payment of over 7,800 pounds. It's backloaded in order to force down the APR, but at the same time defend profits and bring revenue and profits up. Now, the optional final payment is called optional because at the end of the loan, what you can do is either pay back the cash or you can give the loan back to the seller. Another form of loan is a mortgage. And here we see some data, uh, some recent data, looking at interest-only mortgages. And interest-only mortgages where you only pay the interest during the life of the loan and you pay the capital sum right at the end. So it's heavily backloaded. Now, what we hear, see here are some countries that, during the recession period, already had a high percentage of uh, interest-only mortgages. But other countries, like Australia, Denmark, and the UK, have seen a real increase in the percentage of mortgages granted that were interest-only back-loaded. So, what are we going to do about it? What we've got then is a legislation that tells people to concentrate on one APR, but actually we've got a whole bundle of them. And ideally, we should be pressing down on all of them at once. What can be done? Let's go back to that equation I had earlier, the new one, and we'll make another new equation. We'll rearrange it. We rearrange the equation, and we insert the formula for the simple rate of interest. Notice that, the simple rate of interest. And what we find is this. N, the term of the loan, four years, times the simple rate, which was 5%, is equal to the product of all, every APR. So if you want to bear down on all those APRs, we can use this equation to do so. Now, I'd like you to observe something about it. This is extremely counterintuitive. Ask anyone who's steeped in the last 100 years of finance, and they will find this quite surprising. Why? Because the simple rate of interest its formula does not involve any uh, time value of money. There's no discounting there. But actually, it's comprised of all those APRs, every one of which involves discounting. And that's the counterintuitive result. So how can we use this equation in practice? There's a policy conclusion. The policy conclusion is this. If we cap the term of the loan, N, let's say a car loan, you have to pay it back in four or five years, or a mortgage, you have to pay it back in 25 or 30 years. We cap N, and then we make the simple rate the focus of the policy, and competition forces down the simple rate. And by doing that, it presses down on every APR at once. It both lowers the cost of borrowing, and in, it inhibits backloading. Now, the USA was the first country to implement consumer credit legislation with the Truth in Lending Act. And in 2010, it was amongst the first of countries to react to the recession with the Dodd-Frank Act. And the Dodd-Frank Act is a huge piece of legislation. And what that legislation does, amongst other things, is to help protect the consumer. And they do so by putting restrictions on backloaded loans. They help, the Act helps to restrict uh, balloon payments. It helps to restrict interest-only loans. Now, Dodd-Frank may do that, but I don't think it goes far enough. I think it should also make the simple rate the target of the legislation instead of the APR. Now, let's go back right to the beginning when I said abstract does not mean impractical. All around us, there are objects like mobile phones, GPS systems, um, MRI scans. All of these uh, technological things uh, have on their foundation abstract mathematics, including the imaginary numbers that we've just been talking about. And what I hope I've shown is that finance is no exception to this. What we've found is that uh, imaginary interest rates can be used to help us devise a simple improvement in policy that potentially impacts hundreds of millions of people around the world. 
Thank you.